Hello everyone. You may be pretty nervous right now as the SMO Junior is approaching. And so you're looking for some last minute ideas that can help you to score one or two more points. Hopefully, some of the things we're going to discuss here will be useful. But take note that the whole point of Olympiads is that the questions are not predictable. So there's really no way that you can guarantee a type of question will appear or will not appear. But nonetheless, I think there's a use to discussing some frequently occurring concepts, not just for scoring a couple more marks, but just for helping you realize that these problems are actually approachable. And even for those of you who are pretty seasoned, one or two of these ideas may be a little fresh. Now, one of the things that I found very interesting about Olympiads is just all the very big numbers. Now, it felt kind of cool to be able to deal with huge numbers, but the trick is that you don't really deal with the huge numbers. For example, if we look at the first problem, you've got huge powers, but what you do when you're handling huge powers is normally that you want to either make the base the same or you want to make the power the same. Now here you can see that the powers are 300, 200, and 100. So all of them are something 100. And I can write these all as something to the power of 100. Z is 6 to the power of 100. Y has 100 pairs of trees. So it's 3 squared, and you have 100 copies. That's 200 copies of 3, which is 9 to the power of 100. X is 2 to the power of 300, and so that has 100 triples of 2s. And straight away, we can compare these very easily. It means that Y is bigger than X is bigger than Z. So what I'm going to do um, for this video is that you see there's a second question below. I'm not going to give the solution to the second question. I'll only just give the idea. And if you want to pause the video and work through it, you're most welcome to and discuss your solution in the comments below or ask for help if you need to. In this case, for the second question, what you want to notice is that the idea is the same. Since 4026, is just two times of 2013, which is the other power on the right-hand side. Remember that for the SMO, every constant is there for a reason. Yes, you may see 2023 20, all over the place, but 2023 20, appearing more than once is probably there for a good reason. Continuing on this theme of big numbers, one of the fun things about SMO problems is that you don't necessarily have to even understand why it turns out to be a nice number. So one option whenever you encounter a question like this is always to find a pattern. If 9999 squared plus 19999 is supposed to have a nice square root. Well, I don't see why four nines is so important. It probably works with one or two nines. So why not just try to look for the small ones, which you can calculate. Nine squared is 81, plus 19 is 100. The square root of 100 is 10. We probably at least want one more. So 99 squared plus 199, if you were to calculate it, 9801 plus 199 is 10,000. So this is 100. And I think you can roughly tell what's the pattern, right? The pattern is that 9 squared plus something square rooted, you get 10. 99 squared plus something, you square rooted, you get 100. So it is not too surprising that based on the pattern, the answer should be 10,000. Now, using a bit of algebra, however, is actually the intended method. 
And this one has a really obvious pattern, but not all the time are you going to get an obvious pattern, such as in the second example below. So to give an example of how to use the algebra, you usually just look at the most frequently occurring number or the most important looking number, which in this case is 9999 and call it x. Usually, the reason why these even turn out to be a nice number is that there is some reason that comes from a bit of algebra. Now, 19999, you would like to also write this in a way that is related to x. So don't write it as 10,000 plus x. You want to make it as related to x as possible. And 10,000 is just one more than 9999. So instead, write it as 2x plus 1. You see that this is very familiar looking. Any of you that have even done a little bit of algebra are likely to recognize this as x plus 1 squared. And so that is why you get 10,000. So many times, algebra is tested using so-called numerical questions. And you have to recognize that there is this particular algebraic identity or equation that you can use. So for instance, for the example, you would like to use a difference of squares factorization. Remember that m squared minus n squared is m plus n times m minus n. This is your difference of squares factorization. And so I would suggest combining the first and third and the second and fourth. If you're wondering why that combination, well, it can't be the first two because a difference of squares requires something minus something. So let's take the first and third and the second and fourth. I'll leave you to work out this question. By the way, all of these questions are past SMO problems. So these are real. These are the kind of questions you will see sometimes. But even if you don't see a question that looks very much like this, the idea is still important. When we talk about idea, questions that involve integers is one of those where there isn't really a standard method. But you have to realize that a question that says positive integers is actually information because normally all that we have are just real numbers, not positive integers. How does that change things compared to our usual equations? Well, you notice here that we have got, for the first question, two equations for three unknowns. And for the second question, we have only got one equation for three unknowns. So it would seem that you don't have enough information. But with positive integers, it just means that there are limited possibilities. Just based on you being told that there are positive integers. For example, if two positive integers add up to five, then it can either be one and four or two and three. If I told you two real numbers add up to five, oh, that's quite a lot of possibilities, isn't it? So what do we do here? Now, usually you are looking for some reason why the numbers are restricted and cannot be too big. The second equation doesn't tell me that much. I'm going to focus on the first equation and I will just multiply the two throughout on the right hand side. And I'm going to shift the 2xy over. I'm going to shift it into a place that would help you to recognize what's going on. This is our good friend x minus y squared. Now you might be thinking, well, what's the point of this? Why are we doing all this work? Well, a square number plus a square number is two. Now I say square number because x squared doesn't have to be a square number, right? If x is one third, then one ninth is not something you would call a square number. But here, because they're integers, they really are square numbers in the traditional sense. So obviously, this can only happen if both of them are 1. The implication being that um, z is 1, x minus y is 1, 
or negative 1. Of course, at this point, we just have a usual pair of simultaneous equations. With z being 1, x plus y is 20, 21, and x minus y is 1, or x minus y equals to negative 1. And it's not very difficult to see that x, y would be 10, 10, 10, 11, or vice versa. So the question asks you for the value of x1 plus x2, which are the two possible values of x, that would just be 10, 10 plus 10, 11, which is 20, 21. Using the same idea, you can look at the second question and just think, you know what? Fractions are usually quite small if it's 1 over some whole number. If let's say that all of them are even just 5, 1 fifth plus 1 fifth plus 1 fifth doesn't even reach 1. It's not even close to 1, it's 3 fifths. So you need to have a, b, and c to be quite small, otherwise the fractions are too small. And where you would start is to say that, well, 1 over a has to be at least 1 third, because if it's 1 quarter, 1 quarter, 1 quarter, then you don't even reach 1. So you would start off by saying that this is at least 1 third, and so a can only be 2 or 3. And from there, I think things are relatively easy. One more thing before we move on away from talking about equations. Not everything that has an equal sign is an equation. Now, you may have seen some of these kinds of questions in the recent SMOs and think, oh my goodness, how does anyone solve that equation? Then you are kind of asking the wrong question. I've written in the header, identities aren't equations. Now, equation means equal if blah 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 blah. Now identities that means they are identical so always the same. It's just like in English right if I say that John is Peter's brother. Now um, John is Peter's brother doesn't change right. John is always Peter's brother. If Peter flies away to the US John is still Peter's brother. If John gets injured, John is still Peter's brother. So that is an identity. It's always the same. It always is true. Whereas if I told you that John is eating lunch. Now that is, is talking about right now. John is eating lunch. John isn't eating lunch for his entire life continuously and doing nothing else. John is eating lunch only at a moment. Whenever you're solving equations, it's usually something that's at the moment. So in our previous example, x plus y plus z is 2022 20, in this problem only. 1 over a plus 1 over b plus 1 over c is 1 in this problem only. That's not true for our two examples here. When we say equals, what we're trying to say in this case is that we have this. Now it's not asking you to solve. We are saying assume that. Now, if I tell you that these are the same, it means that they are literally the same in the same way as if I told you that for Pythagoras theorem, c squared equals to a squared plus b squared, this is not asking you to solve it. It's asking you to use it. So you can use this on any triangle, any right angle triangle, I should say. So here, you can put in any value of x that you want. And this will be true. Now, this is not cheating. This is not one of those cases where, oh, the answer is unique, so I'm assuming it. No, we are trying to say that those two things are literally the same thing. If I told you that x is 2x divided by 2, those are identical, I can put in any x I like. So all you need to do is to choose the suitable number x in order for the expression to appear. a0 minus a1 plus a2 minus a3 plus a4 minus a5, that's all somewhere down here. And you would like to make sure that when you put in a number, 
it looks like that. So for this case, we would let x to be negative 1. If x is negative 1, the left hand side is just 1 in all of these brackets, which we are very happy with. Whereas the right hand side is going to be exactly what we want, just in the opposite order. So it would be negative 1 to odd powers is negative. Negative 1 to the power of even powers is going to be positive 1. So you see that this is what we want, just in the reverse order. And so your answer is simply 18. You can do the same idea for the second example. The value of x will be a bit different. And also just pay attention to the fact that a0 is missing. So as you're solving that, make sure that you don't forget. Attention to detail is really important for Olympiads because these are questions you have never seen before. So it's very easy to overlook something. So read it very carefully and also read what they ask you to find very carefully. Unfortunately, there are no partial marks. So if you're 90% correct, you do not get 90% of the mark, you get no marks. And that's really unfortunate. At the midway point, we have um, 10 things we want to say. So at the midway point, I show you another very scary looking thing that is not really scary in a very specific circumstance. Now, when you see this square root inside square roots, I'm sure it looks horrible. But what is different about this from normal square root questions is that very often, you're going to be given the same thing except with a sign flipped from plus to minus and minus to plus. We call these conjugates. For example, if I have got a 9 plus uh, square root 3 and 9 minus square root 3. So you flip the sign on the square root. Those are called conjugates. Now, why do we like conjugates? Well, conjugates sort of is another word for partners. And partners are supposed to work well together. So in what way do they work well? Well, in that example here, the sum would be nice because the square root is gone. The product is also nice because if you use your difference of squares expansion, the sum times the difference it's going to put a square on the square root, which is what we always want to do with square roots, isn't it? So just an illustration there of why these conjugates work well together. Now you're, you might be saying that, so what? I mean, I can't add or subtract or multiply or divide this stuff. They're all in just separate giant square roots. Well, not to worry. What you do is that first of all, just call this whole thing, let's say x. We've done that before. Let's do it again. And I'm going to square it very carefully. Just a quick note that for this question, you will see this brackets that have this sort of um, L shapes and reverse L shapes. This is called a flaw. And flaw just means round down. Remember the SMO questions always have a whole number answer. And so sometimes these are put there just to mean round down. So don't worry about it. This is just for your final answer. Okay, so x squared is going to be 45 plus square root 2021 20, from squaring the first thing, 45 minus square root 2021 20, from squaring the second thing. And then remember that a minus b squared this is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. So please don't forget the middle term. Somehow we always tend to forget. Don't forget it. So it will be minus 2 times the first one times the second one, which I can just merge into a single square root. Now remember what we said about conjugates. They go well together. By squaring it, we are kind of trying to remove this barricade and allow them to meet. 
So by them meeting together, the sum, you get rid of the square root, which is 90. For the other one, the product, 45 plus root 2021, 20, 45 minus root 2021 20, just gives you 45 squared minus 2021, 20, which you will be happy to know, 45 squared minus 2021 20, is just 4, and so this is going to be equal to 86. That's not our answer, right? Because remember, this is x squared. So x squared is 86. And therefore, what's the flow of x? The flow of x means that x is 9 point something. Since 9 squared is 81 and 10 squared is 100, you round it down to 9. Well, if you haven't seen my video uh, just recently on the SMO tips, do take a look because a question like this is also an example where you can exploit a little bit of estimation right? because square root of 2021 20, is also very close to 45. And so another way to do this is to simply take the second one as almost nothing. And X is going to be just roughly square root of 90 which is also 9 point something. So if you recall what I mentioned in the other video, use the fact that you don't have to show your workings and use the fact that the answers are whole numbers. Sometimes you can just do some estimations if you are stuck and are unable to find the proper method. You can do something similar for the second example, but I would encourage you to try to do it using the intended method I have shown, just in case some square roots are a little bit more difficult to estimate than the one that I've shown here. On the topic of square roots, one of the places where you will see square roots appearing is Pythagoras theorem. Pythagoras theorem is very useful for the geometry questions in the SMO Junior mainly because that's the point of difference from primary school geometry Olympiads to secondary school geometry in Olympiads. You might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? I've used Pythagoras theorem in primary school before. What's the difference? The answer is very simple. In primary school, you have that assurance that everything is a whole number. For the SMO, you only have an assurance that the final answer is a whole number. And so you want to use Pythagoras, but use it carefully. Try not to make a glut of square roots appear too early by always writing C is square root A squared plus B squared. You don't want your square roots because that's not nice. We don't voluntarily bombard ourselves with square roots. So for the first question, you are told that this is a piece of paper and you have folded it over. Before I use the Pythagoras theorem, I'm just going to note the lengths that we are given. This is 12, it's a rectangle, so this is also 12. This is 24, and it got folded over to here, so that's also 24. Now, I mean to use Pythagoras, not in the sense of, okay, um, AC is square root 12 squared plus 24 squared. No, this is not what I mean by using Pythagoras. It's not wrong, but it's not useful, is it? It has nothing to do with the area of the overlapping region. So when you're using Pythagoras, you want to be a little bit more judicious and ask yourself, well, what am I trying to find? To find the area of the shaded region, what you would like to find is this length here, because that would be the base of the shaded triangle with the height being CD, which is 12. Therefore, if you would like to find that length, what have we done so far in all of these issues when we're trying to find something and we can't find it? We call it X. We call it X because that's what we want to find. And now I can 
also call this 24 minus x. And one more thing is that you want to use as many nice properties as you can so that you don't end up with a huge number of equations. Hopefully, you realize that just by symmetry, the two unshaded triangles, namely the two that I'm shading right now, are congruent to each other, meaning that they are the same size, same shape. And so therefore, I could also shift the 24 minus x here, or I could shift the x there, well, all the same. Right? It's just by symmetry. Because of that symmetry, you realize that we only have one unknown and one equation, which is going to be over here. 12 squared plus 24 minus x squared equals x squared. And this is how you use Pythagoras. You want to use Pythagoras without just waiting for numerical values. Because Pythagoras is just a free equation. You may not like equations every, very much, but that's how math works. You want more equations, not less equations. So let's try to just solve this. I will expand 24 squared minus 2 times 24 times x plus x squared. And just nice, x squared cancels out. So after solving this, x is equal to 15. And that is the length you want. The area is half times 12 times 15. So you've seen how Pythagoras can help you to find lengths. Even if you seem to say, I only know one length, how can I use one length to find two lengths? You can use one length to find two related lengths. And so I would ask you to try the same thing for the second question, where the idea is to make the right angled triangles appear yourself and use symmetry to help you. A circle is always symmetric. So you get some symmetry, and I'm not just talking about AOB and COB being symmetric. I can even just add in a line of symmetry for this triangle. And that would give me a new triangle with length 7 and a right angle. So I can call this height h and the radius r. Do the same thing here so that you get a rectangle. This is 7. This is h. And this little bit here is the radius minus 7. And so you will have two equations. 7, h, and r, as well as the tiny one over there, h, r minus 7, and 6. From here, guess and check is not entirely wrong, but the easiest way is to just subtract the two equations and then solve for r. Right? That's what you're supposed to find. Now, you notice that we have been making algebra just pop up everywhere. Algebra in geometry questions, algebra in our so-called numerical questions, and you may be a little bit sick of algebra. Here's something that is pretty legitimately not algebra. Divisibility tests and remainder. Something that you have seen before in primary school, but I can assure you that there are still harder questions that can be asked than the primary school Olympiads. An example would be the first one we see over here. To use the divisibility test, there are two issues. One, there is no divisibility test for 6, but that's quite easily resolved. 6 is 2 times 3, so just do a test for 2 and 3. Now 2, that's straightforward, the number is odd. But for 3, how do I know the remainder when it is divided by 3? The test for 3. Sum up the digits and then divide by 3 to get the remainder. Well, that sounds awful. How am I supposed to do that? Well, we can upgrade our divisibility test 
a little bit. And so the upgrade that we can do is that the divisibility test does not just work exactly as it is told to you. For example, for the test for 3 or 9, you can upgrade it to the sum of just contiguous segments, which sounds like an awfully fancy word, but what I mean is that you can also split it up anywhere, any way you like and add up those things instead of adding it up digit by digit. So in order to get the remainder when dividing by 3, I can do a simpler task which is to add up from 1 to 20, 21. And when I add up from 1 to 20, 21, it's not really with the intention of adding up from 1 to 20, 21. I just want the remainder when that's divided by 3. So I know how to add up numbers from 1 to 20, 21. It would be 20, 21 numbers times the average, which is 20, 22 over 2. Before I calculate this, 1011 is already a multiple of 3. So therefore, the remainder when divided by 3 is just 0. But that's not the answer, is it? Because we are not saying that this number is divisible by 6. It is divisible by 3 and it is odd. So what can the remainder be when it is divisible by 3 but odd? It can't be 1 because if the remainder is 1, that means that it was not divisible by 3. The only possibility is that it is 3. So know your divisibility test well. And for the second question, the same procedure, split it into 3 and 11. And for 11, your test is going to be an alternating sum. But make sure you know where to alternate from if you are trying to find a remainder. Let's say if you wanted to find the remainder when 4321 is divided by 11. Well, if you just did direct division, you get 392, remainder 9. So if you said alternating sum and say, okay, I do 4 minus 3 plus 2 minus 1 is 2. Wait, that's not right. And indeed, it is not. Because for the alternating sum for 11, it needs to be from right to left. In other words, 1 minus 2 plus 3 minus 4, which gives you negative 2. And negative 2 means that it is 2 less than a multiple of 11. And so that's how you get 9 as your remainder. So make sure you know your test. And these are not just tests for divisibility. These are also tests for what the remainder is equal to. As I mentioned in another comment, it's worthwhile to think about why these are true. But I do call this a last minute SMO crash course, right? So I think now is not the time to think about why it is true. Now is the time to just make sure that you can apply it correctly. Another word on number theory, this time highest common factor and lowest common multiples. If you're like me, my first introduction to the highest common factor in primary school is using this table, which my teacher called like a HDB block. If you want to find, let's say, the highest common factor of something like uh, 20 and 30, you say, okay, I take out a 2. And then after that, I take out a 2 again. No, I can't take out a 2. I can take out a 5. And then after that, you stop and say that, okay, there's nothing left already. And so my HCF 
based on the left column is 2 times 5 is 10. And this is probably how you were taught the first time. And this is perfectly good if you know what the numbers are, isn't it? We don't know what the numbers are for a question like this, so I can't even try to draw this HTB block out. Instead, I want you to have this notion of every number being like a list of demands. Every number is like a list of demands, and that list of demands is based on its prime factorization. So here you can guess, but I'm just going to show you the full method, which is that, let's say for 80 and 40, you can prime factorize it as 2 cubed times 5, and 2 to the power of 4 times 5, 12 is 2 squared times 3, and 252, that will take a little while, it's 2 squared times 3 squared times 7. So each number is a list of demands, and also you can think of it as a list of resources. So 80 contains 4 tools and a 5. Highest common factor is asking you what resources do these two numbers both possess? And so this here tells you that x possesses a 2 cubed and a 5. It does not have a 2 to the power of 4, otherwise that would have been in common. For the second statement, 2 squared and 2 squared, so it means that, well, x had 2 cubed, so it's okay. It also has 2 squared, so if it has 3 tools, it also has 2 tools. However, it doesn't have 3 squared. It only has 1 tree, otherwise 3 squared would have been in common. It also does not have a 7, otherwise that would have shown up. And so therefore you compare this and this, it means that the minimum x would need to have 2 cubed, it would need to have a 3, and it would need to have a 5. So that is equal to 120. Coincidentally enough, it is actually true that 120 is the lowest common multiple of 40 and 12. Does it make sense why that's a good idea? Well, the lowest common multiple is kind of the reverse of that. So in the second question, the lowest common multiple looks for the bigger one. It looks for, if let's say here 42 is 2 times 3 times 7 and 14 is 2 times 7, why are they asking me for a 3? Well, that means that x must have a 3. And you can reason similarly for the second part. So the prime factorization may seem like a little bit of overkill here, but I can assure you that you would really like to be able to use the prime factorization for many purposes. And one of the purposes that is quite interesting is that you can count factors using the prime factorization. For instance, if I give you a huge number, 2 to the power of 7 times 3 to the power of 11 times 5 to the power of 4, you would be thinking, okay, how long is it going to take me to calculate this? What if I ask you how many factors does it have? Well, there is actually a very simple shortcut. And all you need to do is to take the powers and add 1 to them and multiply it together. So 7 plus 1 is 8, 11 plus 1 is 12, 
4 plus 1 is 5, and so I can say that this has 480 factors. Why does that work? The reason is actually not so complicated if we continue on this discussion of factors, meaning looking for resources. For a number to be a factor of this 2 to the 7 times 3 to the power of 11 times 5 to the power of 4, a factor must look like 2 to the power of something, 3 to the power of something, and 5 to the power of something. You can't say that my factor includes the number 19. No, 19 is nowhere to be found in that prime factorization. We also can say that the factor of 2 cannot exceed 7 because that's as many as is available. If you took 2 to the power of 8, that's not a factor. And so your options in the power are 0 to 7, 0 to 11, and 0 to 4. And yes, I mean 0. 0 means don't use that prime number. What's wrong with that? 1 is a factor. And 1 would be 2 to the power of 0, 3 to the power of 0, and 5 to the power of 0. So nothing wrong with that. And 0 to 7 means 7 plus 1 choices. 0 to 11 means 11 plus 1 choices. 0 to 4 is 4 plus 1 choices. And then you multiply them to find the total number of options. So you can see here that this is a very useful tool, and in fact, the questions that I've selected here are relatively tame by comparison because it just says four factors and three devices, which is the same as factors. But you are asked to find the numbers or to count the numbers. That's why you can't just say that I'm just going to list out four factors. What's so hard about that? because you are asked the reverse question. So it helps to know that this is the way to count factors so that you know four factors could either be three plus one or four is two times two, which is one plus one times one plus one. What does that mean? Three plus one corresponds to a prime number cubed. 1 plus 1 and 1 plus 1 means that you have two different prime numbers with the power being 1. So p, q, where p and q are prime numbers. And with that, we just need to count how many numbers are like that. The two examples, 6 is 2 times 3 is one of the second type, and 8 equals to 2 cubed is one of the first type. So we just need to list it out. That has to be done carefully, of course, but it is now a systematic task and not just factoring the numbers one by one by one. So p cubed, the only thing that fits is three cubed, which is 27, and everything else goes past 50. For pq, it's the product of two prime numbers and two times just about everything is going to fit. So 2 times 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and 23 are all of the prime numbers that can fit there. And then you have a handful more. 3 times 5, 3 times 7, 3 times 11, 3 times 13, 3 times 17 is 51, so we don't include that. And then 5 times 7, and that is basically the end of the list. Everything else is going to exceed, and we cannot use a prime squared. A prime squared would have three factors, not four. I think I just spoiled the second question, didn't I? So in total here, if we count it, there are a total of 13 numbers. And I've included this question just to mention one thing. Don't be afraid to do a bit of listing. As long as you know what you're doing, listing is not some mathematical sin. You are allowed to list as long as your list is complete and your list is not going to be 700 numbers long. Listing is okay. So not everything is going to be some complicated method or some sophisticated theorem. 
And to conclude, some things are just common sense. You can't really put a finger on a theorem. If we look at the first question, we might be thinking, how am I supposed to actually find that? Two digit number that is 18 more than the product of its two digits. Well, forget about thinking too hard. The answer is 99. <laughs> because 99 works. And obviously you can't find anything larger. There are going to be problems like this. And problems like this are the sorts that are challenging those of you who maybe are a bit too eager to solve the question. And then you start cataloging theorem after theorem after theorem, formula after formula. Remember, these questions are supposed to be fun. There are also some others that are just a bit strange looking, like the second question. If you looked at the second question, it doesn't seem very hard to solve because 10 minus 2x is just negative 2 times of x minus 5. So if I just cancel this off, m is going to be negative 2x minus 1. Or rather, another way of thinking about it is that x is 1 plus m over negative 2. Wait, how do I have no solutions in x? So there are some questions which are like this. And you just need to look back at your steps and sit back and think. What could have gone wrong with my steps? How do I find m without finding x? But how do I find x when they tell me there's no solution in x? So there's no x, isn't there no m? So this is very confusing and very weird. Well, the only thing that can go wrong is when you cancel off x minus 5. The problem is that what if x equals to 5? Well, you might say, then don't let it be 5. Precisely. So if x equals to 5 is the solution, then it is not a solution. And so if this was 5, then this is actually going to be not a solution. So you want to be able to analyze questions that are unusual. That's at the heart of Olympiads. And so at the end of the day, I've just shown you 10 ideas for the SMO Junior. But remember just to have some fun and also to reason things out on your own. You're all better at math than you think you are. So reason things out. Don't just rely on formulas. Don't just rely on having seen the question before. That's the entire spirit of doing Math Olympiads. And on that note, I'll be concluding this mini crash course. Feel free to comment below if you have any questions. And also feel free to comment below if you'd like to discuss any of the second questions here, which I didn't go through in detail. So all the best everyone, and I hope this helped a little bit.